Okay, folks, let me talk to those of you who have just been kind of hanging out at Graceway for a while, maybe for a week or two, maybe for a year or two. Uh, first of all, I'm glad you're here. But maybe you're at that phase in life where you're thinking, I kind of like it here. Uh, how do I get more involved? How do I get plugged in? Uh, do you like have member classes or something? Uh, well, yes and no. We, we don't like the word member because we think that it implies the church might be an exclusive place, like a country club or something, a member. Uh, and we don't like it because sometimes in American Christianity it implies a sense of entitlement or benefit, like, oh, I'm a member now. Uh, we prefer to talk about sharing in a common mission of advancing the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are a church community. The word church means assembly. And uh, we assemble together to share with each other our resources, our skills, our time, our talent, all of these things in order to advance the kingdom of God. And we would love to have you uh, on that journey with us and to be a full part of what God is doing here. And if you'd like to know what's the first step to take, uh, I've got the answer for you. It's a class, and the name of the class, and we came up with this after a lot of committee meetings and much prayer, is called First Step. Isn't that brilliant? And uh, so when you hear that announced, First Step class, that's your cue. And uh, we do this three or four times a year. You can ask somebody at the VIG counter, the nice folks out there, right as you leave the auditorium and the lobby. They'll be glad to tell you when the next one starts. You'll see it in the little handout that we get when you come in. You'll hear somebody up on the platform talking about it or in the video. So anytime you hear that word, first step, that's your clue. First step, take it. My name is Jeff, one of the pastors here, and if this is your first time to be here, wow, you picked a good day. We are just finishing this morning what we've called the Injustice Series. We've been at it all month of September, and wow, we have, uh, we've been on a pretty amazing journey along the way, and uh, we have been trusting God to raise $200,000, 180000 of that, to go toward translating Scripture beginning with the book of Luke, the same book that we've been studying for a long time on Sunday morning, for the Namkeli people in Western Africa. And then 20,000, uh, a tithe of 200,000 to remain here in our own community to remind us that injustice is something that is not just there or here, it's in the world. We are citizens in, in a very real sense of the world. And that is becoming more and more true with every passing day. And so along the journey, we have been asking God not just to raise an offering. We've been asking God to do a work in us and to make us a more generous church, a better serving church, to make us a more strategic church as far as God's plan in the world is concerned. And to do that, we have been basing our comments on the book of Jonah, one of the Old Testament prophets. A very short book, very powerful book, and this morning we're going to finish our study of that. Jonah, just a review of uh, the obvious here, Jonah was commissioned by God to take God's word to the empire that in his day was you might say the original evil empire, the Assyrians. They were horrible, absolutely evil. And uh, God said, Jonah, I want you to take my word to them. Jonah said, uh-uh. He rebelled, and he went exactly in the opposite direction of where God told him to go. And you know the story, very famous story. God did some convincing by giving him a journey of three days and three nights inside the belly of a whale. And uh, Jonah reluctantly, when he was spit out onto the land, said, okay, I guess I'd better obey. And he did. Uh, God's word came to him the second time. He went to Nineveh and uh, preached a one-verse message. Five words in the original language. It takes us eight words to say it in Hebrew or in English, what he said. And uh, wow, I can promise you when he preached it, I just don't think there was a lot of passion. He was pretty upset about it. And so now, if you got your Bible, tune in to Jonah chapter 4. All right, Jonah chapter 4. Let's see how the story ends. Now, this is what this is in response to. Jonah has preached this message. The people of Nineveh have repented They've fallen down on their faces before God and said, God, we, we want to turn from our evil. 
And you would think that Jonah would be happy about that. Jonah is majorly ticked off. And that's what chapter 4 is all about. Let's read it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray you, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? This is what I told you God was going to happen. I know you. I knew you were going to do this. Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and you repent of the evil. If you're following along in the King James Bible, what we would say today is you relent of the judgment that you planned. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beg you, my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And then said the Lord, do you well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city, sat on the east side of the city, and there made himself a shelter, and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. Just a moment ago, he was exceeding mad because God had spared Nineveh. Now he is exceeding glad because of a stupid gourd. This is an amazing story. And so what happens here is in verse 7 it says, But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Really? And God said to Jonah, Do you well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, You've had pity on the gourd. For the which you've not labored, neither made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score, that would be 120, 120,000 persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. In other words, that's a poetic way of saying, should I not have spared the 120,000 children in this city who don't even know the difference between right and wrong? Oh, and also much cattle. And that's the rather enigmatic way that the book of Jonah ends. So what's up with that? We're going to talk this morning about what's your gourd? What, what's, what's the deal with this gourd? And what's, what's really going on here? And before I get into that, let me just take a minute, and because we've been studying Jonah now for the last four weeks before today. And I want to review just a few of some of the lessons that we've learned and teach you another one from today. Five key lessons from Jonah that I want us to remember. Number one, God never stops being God. Now you would say, yeah, isn't that obvious? Well, evidently not. Because Jonah, like so many of us, thinks that he can rebel against God, run in the opposite direction, do what he wants to do and get away with it. I think we're pretty much that stupid yet today. But God never stops being God. You can ignore him, but he's still there. You can reinvent him, rename him, create a religion to explain him, but he's still the same as he's always been. He is God. He's sovereign. He's almighty. He's all-powerful. And as God, he confronts all sin and all injustice in the world. He just doesn't usually do it in the way that you and I think that he should and when he should. But he is, after all, still God. Lesson number one. Lesson number two, God deals with injustice through the transformational power of his word. Now, we spent a lot of time talking about that last week, reminding ourselves in the Bible that God created the universe with his word. He reveals himself to us with his word, and his word is, in a word, transformational. Totally and completely transformational. And all through the Bible, God sends forth his word to all of the peoples of the world, even the evil ones like the Ninevites. 
He gives us a call to repent, to turn from our evil ways. And when we do, just like we see here in Jonah, he's merciful and full of grace. Now, this is the theme that we've seen in Jonah. It's also the theme that we have seen over and over in our study of the Gospel of Luke, that the Word of God is for everyone, every single group of people on this planet. Sometimes we hear erroneous teaching in churches. Well, the Old Testament, that was for the Jews, and the New Testament, that's for the rest of us. Now, I'll go back and read the book. There's one book, one story, one kingdom, one king, one purpose, one mission. And that's exactly what we have been seeing here. And, and the issue in Jonah is just that, that God has a word for Nineveh. As evil and horrific a people as they have been, God has a word for them, and he will not rest until he has gotten his word to them so that they can either change their evil way or perish in the wrath of his judgment. But how can God get his word to Nineveh until it's translated? That's ultimately what Jonah did. Jonah's a Hebrew. The Ninevites spoke Aramaic. Hebrew, Aramaic, they're somewhat similar languages, but yet they're two different languages. So Jonah had to communicate from his own language into Aramaic, and he did so reluctantly with no passion. Five words in the original, eight words it takes us to say it in English. A single verse, you might say, but wow, when he did, the results were spectacular. We'll talk about that in just a second. Here's lesson number three. There's a whale in the room. You remember that was the title of one of our studies this month. There's a whale in the room. We talk about there being an elephant in the room when there's something so obvious, but nobody wants to admit it, nobody wants to recognize it, nobody wants to talk about it, and somebody says, wait a second, there's an elephant in the room. Well, in the book of Jonah, there's a whale in the room. In fact, there's probably several of them. One of them is that Jonah is like so many believers today who would rather be comfortable than to confront injustice. They think it's all about them. Jonah was like that. Now, understand Jonah. Okay, when the Word of God came to him and said, hey, I want you to go to Nineveh, he understands that to do so, he's going to be uncomfortable. He's going to be inconvenienced. It's not going to be an easy journey. In fact, it's going to be downright dangerous. And the fact of the matter is, Jonah was pretty happy with his life like it was. He had his routines down. He was, he was comfortable. He was, he was living the good life, the, the, the Jewish dream. We talk about the American dream. He was living the Jewish dream. And he thought it was just great. But there's a deeper issue here. And this is really the serious issue. This, this is really the whale. Here, here's the issue. God loves the Ninevehs of the world. God loves the victim and God loves the oppressor. And he loves us alike. God loved Nineveh, but God's people did not. They hated Nineveh. That was the issue. Love to talk about the love of God, but it was all about God loving me. And there's the whale. Jonah never learns to love the people that God loves. Something is wrong. There is a whale in the room. You know, before God came to him and said, Jonah, I want you to take my word to the Ninevites, I, I, I would imagine, I don't know, I, I didn't know Jonah, did not live then, but I would imagine that probably all of his life, Jonah has not one time ever even thought about taking the word of God to Nineveh. Why would he? That's the enemy. Those are the evil people. That, that's, the, that's the reason I'm glad that God loves me and I'm on God's side and God's on my side. He had never given a thought to taking the word of God to Nineveh until God came to him and commissioned him. And all of a sudden, suddenly, he, he has no excuse. You know what's happened this month? Every Sunday you've walked in over the list of 1,967 names of languages that in 2013 still do not have a single verse of Scripture. Still. Because most believers, like Jonah, are so focused on me. And probably, honestly, most people would have to admit before this month you never really gave much thought 
to the need to translate Scripture into these 1,967 languages. Here's the deal. Suddenly, we don't have an excuse. Suddenly, it's like, okay, are we going to do this or not? We're kind of like Jonah. Do we get with God or do we get on a boat headed in the opposite direction? Here, here's the deal. And I'm not, I'm not believe me, this is, this is not guilt motivation. I'm, I'm not here to say, oh, if we don't do this, then the whole world's going to fall. No, I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you God's going to do this with or without us. And you need to understand that. He, he doesn't need us. Because I've read the last book in the Bible, and in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, speaking of the Lord Jesus, it says they sung a new song saying, you are worthy to take the book and to open the seals of it, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Guess what? When Jesus comes, when that kingdom comes that we just sang about, when that happens, there are going to be representatives from every group and language of people on this planet. God's going to get the job done. But here's the deal. He is giving us the privilege and the opportunity to be part of the greatest mission in history. That's the motivation. I mean, why not? Aren't you getting a little bit tired of living inside a whale? I mean, really, that's what happened. That's why so many many lives are topsy-turvy, because they are ignorant of God's big purpose. And so we go through life just thinking about me, mine, and, and, and what I can get, Rather than, who is God? What's he doing? And how do I get with him? And that's really what the book of Jonah is all about. And then we talk, lesson number four, about the ultimate injustice. We've talked about a lot of injustices in the world, and they're horrible. And we said repeatedly that as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be justice seekers and justice doers. But here, here's the issue. If we want all of our hard effort to be sustainable... It's not going to happen if we're working without the Word of God. It's like the video you saw this morning. What happens when the Word of God comes to a people who have never seen it, never heard of it? Everything changes. Everything. Everything. We can go in and start an orphanage and start an NGO, and we can start this and start that, and we can work really hard and hard and hard and hard, but until there is transformation in the human heart, all of our effort is not sustainable. And i got news for us. We're not what transforms people. God does. And he does it through his word. That's the issue. Jeff, are you saying we shouldn't do any of that stuff? No, I'm saying we should. I'm saying we must. But I'm just saying if we don't have the word of God to sow in the hearts of people, what are we doing? It was hard for a couple of thousand of us to load up on a plane and, and, and go somewhere in, in, the, in the world and, and, and do something together to confront injustice. It's like we, we, we have a relationship with an organization here in Kansas City, Veronica's Voice, that, that works with, uh, with victims of sexual trafficking and prostitution and stuff. It's, it's great, but y- you know what? For the most part, they just say, pray for us and love us, but don't come down and mess with what we're doing because when you show up, it all changes. <laughs> You don't want a bunch of church people hanging around with what they're trying to do. And so we pray. And, 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 but here, here's something that we can do as the church. We can be a part of getting the Word of God to people who have never had it. So that as God uses our individual interest and skills and talents and abilities and careers in order to engage in many of these areas, we've got the tools to work with. Okay, That's what we're talking about. And I hope that makes sense to you and what it is because in no way do we want to minimize or ignore the many injustices in the world. We, we learned last week in Romans 1, how does injustice permeate a society? One sin at a time. And there's a cumulative effect. So how, how do you face injustice when it seems so overwhelming? And the answer, I believe, is one verse at a time. And the effect is also cumulative. The Word of God. Here's lesson number five, and this is new today, and I want you to dial in Jonah chapter four one more time. Here's the lesson. God's kingdom extends to all creation and all aspects of life. This is is the last verse of the chapter, verse 11 of chapter four. And should I not spare none of that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? You know, it's been often remarked that 
what this verse says is that God cares more about the children and the cattle of Nineveh than Jonah does about their eternal souls. I think that's a fair statement. I think you could deduce that. But I think there's something much deeper here that we often overlook. And here's what we often overlook. Much cattle, that represents society, economy. It represents everything. In other words, the message is God loves the economy of Nineveh. God loves the society of Nineveh. God loves all the aspects of the civilization and his entire creation and children. God saves the entire city. And as we saw in the video today, everything becomes different. Everything. Everything. Let me give you an example of this, and, and you, you've heard me say so many times that in American evangelical Christianity, especially since the Second World War, we have been so guilty of truncating the gospel. We've lopped the head off. We, we give the impression that all we care about is going out and saving souls and rescuing people and putting them in the lifeboats and taking them to heaven. Well, I'm glad that eternal salvation is part of God's plan for those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm glad I'm saved. I hope you are. But here's the deal. The message of the New Testament is not about escaping. The message of the New Testament is about God's kingdom coming to earth. And we're a part of that. Let me give you an example. Two countries in Central America, okay, my, my stomping grounds. I'll just give you a couple examples, El Salvador and Honduras. We've got a lot of Salvadorans, a lot of Hondurans in our church. Así que por favor, sepan que los amo y no hablo... Con prejuicio ni nada. And if you didn't understand what I said, that's fine. Somebody did. Um, but here's the deal. These two countries have an amazing percentage of evangelical believers. El Salvador, now up around 34% evangelical believers. That's more than in this country, by the way. But yet in our corrupted worldview, we still look at El Salvador as a mission field. Hello. Honduras has even more. Some people say 36, 38 percent. I've heard even higher figures. I don't know. Somewhere in that neighborhood is the point that I want to make. But here, here's the deal. Those two countries also have two of the highest murder rates in the world. What's up with that? I'll tell you my personal opinion. Just me thinking. But my personal opinion, somebody that disagrees over there, I, I, that's fine. Somebody's throwing bottles around or cups or whatever. Here's, here's my personal opinion. The problem is that those two countries have bought into the American model of church. They learned it from us. And so they view the church as this fortress-like place where you bring people in to escape the world and you just kind of wait until God zips us out to heaven one day. What a distorted view. The Bible says that we are not to be of the world, but that we are to be in the world as salt and light. And through our vocations and professions and talents and gifts and abilities that God gives us, we are the difference makers. We are his transformation agents with the tool of the Word of God in all areas of life. There needs to be a difference. We are the church. We don't come to church, we don't attend church, we don't go to church. We are the church to be the church in all of these areas of life. And that's the idea. Now, what's the deal with the gourd? I believe that the gourd in the book of Jonah represents a view inside Jonah's heart and it reveals to us this guy has a distorted worldview. Now, I want to point out something to you. The name of the book is not Nineveh. It's Jonah. The primary purpose of this book is to look inside Jonah because he's one messed up dude. It's not about Nineveh as much as it is about Jonah. It's about his heart. It's about his worldview. Because Jonah has an obsession with a stupid gourd. And we're going to talk about the gourd in just a second, but I believe that here in America we have gourds too. And I believe that one of the gourds that we wrestle with is the gourd of materialism and consumerism. And I think it distorts our worldview a lot. I think that's one of the problems that we have. A few weeks ago, uh, 
I, I showed you a, a, a graph. This church has been a generous church through the years, and we praise God for that. But the last couple of years, we, we saw that, that thing, the trend go down, becoming less generous. And that stirred some discussion, wanted it to. Now, there's some explanations. First of all, a little over a year ago, we sent about 300 people out of here to Blue Springs to resurrect a church that was in trouble. And we're glad to be a part of that, sincerely. But to give up 300 people, many of whom are mature leaders and good givers, wow, that's a blow. You don't recover from that overnight. But here's, here's the pathway to recovery, and it's not that hard and it doesn't take that long. Here's the deal. It's not for a few people to give more. It's for everybody to be involved. It's never about the amount, never has been. It's about engagement. Engagement in the mission of God. For all of that, that's the whole purpose, the whale of a sail and, and, and signing up for the verses and, and all of that, doing things in order to achieve a change in us. And here's, here's the deal. We could make our goal of raising $200,000 this month and still fail if there's no corresponding change in us. That was the deal with Jonah. Jonah, Jonah made his goal. Jonah, I want you to take my word to, to this people. No, I don't want to. I'll slam you around inside a whale for three days. Now, what do you think, Jonah? You ready to go? Yeah, okay, God, I'm ready to go. He goes, he does his duty, preaches the word. Hey, you know, y'all wouldn't want to repent, would you? Oh, yes, they all fall down before God. Great revival breaks out. Jonah's mad about it. Jonah finally got the message, but he never did get the point. He accomplished his goal, but he never changed. And he never learned to love the people that God loved. The book of Jonah, in, in my view, is one of the great tragedies in the Bible. Incredible tragedy. It's, it's a book that, that on the surface would appear to be this great victory, but it's really a tragedy. It's kind of like the book of Job is a book that appears to be this great disaster, and it's really a great victory. Things are not always what they appear, are they? So it's learning to be generous. You know, this church is generous in so many ways. Do you realize that one of the things that we do around here is we send our leaders to other places around the world to train other pastors and leaders? Been talking all month about Jeff and Jay, who just a few weeks will be going to northern Iraq, training leaders because of your generosity, because of your giving. And it's so cool because they're going to be going right by Nineveh, which is in northwestern Iraq. They call it Mosul today. And so they've been invited by the locals to come, and, and, and Jeff's going to be teaching the book of Nahum. Nahum, a book written by a Jew against their ancestors. Hope you make it back alive, Jeff. We're praying for you, man. That's what they have asked for, and we're excited about that. We, we, we're not just translating Scripture, but sharing of our people. We just prayed for a young lady on her way to Vietnam. We, we have one of the young ladies in this church right now in a, in a six-month, nine-month stint, whatever it is, in Mongolia. We, we've got a young man getting ready to leave for several months to Turkey and, and another to Egypt. And we've got a couple that will be leaving shortly for Kenya for a year. And, and just the many, many things that go on. And, and it's, it's not just giving money to an offering for Scripture. I'm just wanting to say, Grace Way, thank you for your faithfulness and generosity in all of these areas and more. Let me point out something else about the gourd that I think helps us to see Jonah's heart. Jonah prays two prayers in this book. In fact, in the Hebrew language, this whole book is constructed around two prayers. And they're really designed to show what's inside this guy. Here's the first prayer. It's very pious, very spiritual-sounding, you could pray it in church, and people would think that you were really good, okay, because he says all the right things. It's in Jonah chapter 2. Look at, look at it beginning in verse 1. This is the prayer that he prays from the fish's belly. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, and he said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and you heard my voice. For you had cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and all the floods compassed me about. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out in your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet have you brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came 
raiment unto you and to your holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that which I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Amen and amen. Amen. Doesn't that sound great? I mean, wouldn't you like to be able to pray a prayer like that? He says all the right things. Here's the problem. Just a few days later, he prays another prayer. We read it, chapter 4. It's a mean-spirited, angry, self-centered, mad prayer. Look at it in chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord, and he said, I pray you, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and you relent of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beg you, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Same guy. Same guy, just a few days later. Now, here's the way that Hebrew poetry works, okay? You've heard me give this spiel so many times in our study of Luke. Biblical times, Scripture was written for people who, for the most part, could not read or write. It was written for listeners. And so parallelism was a literary device that writers would use to help oral people get their heads around what was going on. And so this whole thing is one parallel. It begins in chapter 1 with God commission to Jonah, to take his word to Nineveh. And what happens? Jonah rebels, and the first people that he comes in contact with are non-believers who immediately obey God. They fall in love with God, the same God that Jonah's running from. Wow. So then God has this whale swallow up Jonah for three days and three nights, and Jonah prays this wonderfully pious prayer to God out of the whale's belly, and the whale spits him up on the dry land. So then what happens? God's word comes to him again. The same exact commission, word for word. The word of God comes unto him the second time before it could go to Nineveh once. So Jonah gets up, heads to Nineveh, And what happens? He immediately comes in contact with non-believers who do what? They immediately obey God. They immediately obey God and fall on their face before God and cry out for mercy, and God extends the mercy. And then Jonah prays again this mean-spirited prayer. Here's the point of the book. The first prayer is a fraud. It's phony. You want to know what's really inside Jonah? Listen to the second prayer. Here's the deal. Really easy to come to church and learn the lingo. Really easy to come to church. You learn when to raise your hands, when not to. You learn what words to say and what words not to say. You learn all the praise songs, and it's a lot of fun and all that type of stuff. But let me tell you what happens. Here's how you really know what's inside somebody. When their gourd gets crushed. That's what the gourd is about. I mean, can you imagine something so petty? And Jonah's so upset because God has spared these people. So he goes out on the side of the city, and he sits there, makes his little shelter, like, oh, woe is me. And all of a sudden, God causes his gourd to grow and and, and shadow him. And he's like, oh, thank you, God. This is so good because I was so hot. And then the next morning, God has a worm come, and, and the gourd withers away, and Jonah is out of control. Absolutely blows it. What's going on here? Jonah has a distorted worldview. Do you? Who's at the center of your worldview? Is it you or is it God? The truth is not what you say. The truth is what comes out when your gourd is crushed. Jonah's kingdom is small, self-serving. God's kingdom is inclusive. It's universal. It's transformational. The bottom line is this. Jonah does not love his neighbor, do we? Jonah shows the hypocrisy of people who rejoice in their own salvation and they become resentful when God wants to save somebody else. There's a lot of that in American Christianity today. Can I tell you something that's just something to think about? This is just something to think about, just hypothetical. You remember in the the New Testament when at, at the beginning of the church, everybody was from a Jewish background? And then all of a sudden, within just a couple of decades, so many non-Jews had begun following Jesus that non-Jews began to outnumber the Jews. You remember that? 
That's what the book of Acts is about in so many of Paul's writing. And they were all been out of shape like, oh, we, you know, we're, we're kind of glad that they can be saved, but they need to become Jews like us first because they don't do things the way that we do. You remember what a huge problem that was? It's because they never learned to love the people that, that God loved the way that God loves them. Let me just put a hypothetical out. What, hap- what would happen if all of a sudden Muslims became, began coming to Christ by the millions? By the millions. Until pretty soon it would appear that the Muslims began to outnumber people who were coming to Christ from non-Muslim backgrounds. You ever been in a church comprised totally of Muslim background believers? Can I just sum it up in a word? Different. Different. Biblical? Absolutely. Different. You see, Gentile churches back in the first century were different than when Jews would come together to worship. Were they unbiblical? No, they were different. And the Jews couldn't handle it. So what would happen if all of a sudden we woke up one morning and realized there were more people coming to faith from a Muslim background than, than people who were not from a Muslim background? And I say that because we have some people in our church who come to Christ, who come to faith from a Muslim background, and we're very happy. But you, of all people, understand what I'm talking about here. How would everybody else handle that? I say it's hypothetical, but you know something? Muslims are coming to Christ by the millions. More Muslims have come to faith in the last 100 years than in the last 1,400 years put together. You just don't hear about it. A lot of places it's very politically sensitive. How would, I mean, come on, let's be honest. American Christians have a really hard time even accepting for their own kids to be different. Maybe that's where we should start practicing. The issue is, do we really love people the way that God does? And do we really rejoice when people who are not like us come to faith? And are we really okay when they come to faith and they don't become like us and dress like us and think like us and like the same things that we like and have the same preferences in music and dress and all this type of stuff that we do? Can we really handle that? I think there's another aspect about this gourd. It represents an obsession with creature comfort. And and even the language here is so exaggerated. Look in verse 6. The Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was, you know, if I had a gourd come up over my head, I'd go, that's cool. But it says, Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. He's like, oh, yippee, skippy, I got a gourd over me. And, and then in verse 8, it says, It came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished himself to die. And he said, It's better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Do you well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Now, we've got some really good therapists and psychologists in our church. I'd like to know what your opinion of this. I mean, is this a little over the top? I think Brother Jonah could use some counseling. I don't know about you. This is just ridiculous to get that involved with a gourd, a stupid gourd. We would never do anything like that today. But we would stand in line all night in front of the Apple store to drop 500 bucks for the latest iPhone. Wouldn't think five seconds to invest five bucks in giving the Namkili language of the Bible. I got up this morning, people were going into Arrowhead at 4 stinking 30 this morning. And I'm, I love the Chiefs. I'm happy for them. I'm just bitter because I can't tailgate. That's what this is all about. <laughs> but I'm thinking, you know, great, man, support the local guys. I'm with you, yeah. 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I mean, these are the same people who go, I'm so happy about my gourd. <laughs> so here they are, back in their pickup truck with a gourd. They're going, yay, I got a gourd. People really haven't changed much, have we? Man, if we just get that excited about what God is doing in this world. So guys, we come to the conclusion of the Injustice series this morning. It's not really a conclusion It's really the beginning. And I pray that it is the beginning of a whole new day at Graceway. 
I pray this is not the last time. It's not the first time. I pray it will not be the last time that we come together to translate God's Word into another language. It's not the end of raising the $200,000. It's the beginning of something else. And the, uh, something else is this. Will we become a more generous people? Will we become more generous individuals? And I know somebody's going to be sitting around under a tree talking about gourds, but not all of us. Because God is doing a work, and I'm very happy about it. And for that reason, today is really more like a day to celebrate in all sincerity. We're going to celebrate this morning. And there's a couple of things we're going to celebrate. And, and I'm going to ask uh, Jeff Cox to make his way up here along with two representatives from the seed company, uh, Kent Herschelman and Mark Kordick. I'm going to have them come up. Uh, they have a presentation for us. We have a presentation for them. Our church began to begin, be involved in, in Scripture translation back in the 1950s with a couple that went out of our church to Ecuador and translated the Scripture into the Sequoia language. Uh, we, in recent times, have funded other projects. We have funded three projects with the seed company in Mexico, and one of those projects was completed earlier this year. And I'm going to let Kent talk about that. Kent? Pastor Jeff, thanks. You know, every time a translation project begins among a people group somewhere in the world, it's an absolute miracle. But even beyond that, that it's begun and finished is even a bigger miracle. In 2009, Grasslands translator Pedro told us that they were hitting some obstacles. The church really would not use the scriptures. Uh, the pastors felt like they just couldn't do it. There were actually rumors floating around that if they used the scriptures in church, it would split the church. And they were coming up against huge barriers. And the barriers didn't end. They went on and on. But you know, God is faithful, isn't he? He's so faithful. And he broke down every one of those barriers. And on March the 23rd of this year, the grasslands people got the word of God for the first time in history. And you were a big part of that. And it was a great day of celebration. Many, many speakers, wonderful events, uh, the dedication of the New Testament, and the speakers got up and spoke eloquently. But the thing that impressed me the most was an older couple that got up. And they were very humble. They clutched their new Bible to their chest, and in tears they said, what's meaningful to us about this is now that our children and our grandchildren have access to the tortilla of life. Now, if you're looking for that, it's in John 6, 8. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty easy to find. And so we want to celebrate with you today, Pastor Jeff, and with your church, the grasslands people getting the word of God, the tortilla of life. Thanks, Ted. For those of you who are not Mexicanos, this is a tortilla warmer, okay? Algunos saben lo que es. And inside is the bread, the tortilla of life. And uh, if I can figure out how to open oh, yeah. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen, the finished product. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to set that right here if you would like to uh, come up afterwards and see what your prayer and your giving has accomplished. And it's kind of very nice that we are celebrating this today, the very same day that we are initiating a project in Western Africa. And Mark, we're glad to have you. Sure, on behalf of the seed company leadership, and literally you guys are, are reaching out and taking the hand of tens of thousands in Mexico through providing the tortilla life to so many that are tasting it for the first time. Taste and see that the Lord is good, the scriptures say. And thanks for your boldness also in stepping forward to an area of Africa that has been abandoned. They've never ever heard God's voice in history. Yet you, through your boldness in prayer and of seeking 
might God be linking us with this obscure people group? And then miraculously, mother tongue translators were raised up and we've linked, you guys have linked arms with them. And God's word, the gospel of Luke is coming to life in Africa because of you. Thanks so much. Good to have you guys. Thank you. I asked Jeff Cox to come up because uh, I, I've asked him to give us an update on where we stand in this project. Where are you, Jeffrey? There you are. There we are. All right. We are at, with the matching gift, $161,082. Okay? But here's what's impressive. If you do the numbers with the matching gift, we would need to raise another $20,000 today with a matching gift of another $20,000 and we get the 200,000. We had whale of a sales yesterday, even with the weather and everything. I know we'll get that money coming in. Um, had a luau with middle school, raised money through that. Had a kid's night out where you paid more for the babysitting and all those funds came in, plus all the offerings. And this is just something the first service didn't get to hear, but you'll get to hear it, it's kind of cool. So we need 20,000 day, you think you're gonna come the last day, what's it gonna be? I know we already did the offerings and everything. And then somebody comes up to me in the first service, $10,000. So that's half of it right there. So here's the thing, and here's the encouragement. You can still participate. Still need another $10,000 at least today. As you leave, we have an um, offering on the walls, those um, buckets back there, the receptacles. You can drop a check in there. You just put Bibles on there. But it doesn't just stop here because, you know, you're around at this church. You can put Bibles on your offering and you can give to this. This is going to be a reoccurring thing. If you have not participated yet, like Jeff was talking about earlier, it's not how much. It's that everyone participates. And here's the challenge. If you haven't bought one verse, why not? All right. Thanks, Jeff. This is a faith check, okay? And even though we haven't counted the offering for today, this is a check for $180,000 to the seed company for this translation project. And, of course, this is not counting the $20,000 that we have taken out as a tithe for our own local needs here in our, our local community. And so I'm giving it to these guys symbolically. I mean, has anybody ever tried to cash a real check like this? I mean, you see these things all the time, like walk into the bank, like, can I deposit this? No, uh, you can't. So this is symbolic, gentlemen, and I'm going to present this to you uh, for you to be able to have. And in a few weeks from now, once all the proceeds have come in, we will give them the real money. Thank you. Thank you. Very cool. Wow, it's been, a, it's been a good month. It's been a fun month. We get back in Luke next, uh, next month. I guess i got to start reading Luke again to get ready, huh? Let's stand up. Let's uh, pray as we're dismissed today.